Steve Albini, July 22, 1962, to May 7, 2024, was an American musician, record producer, audio engineer, and music journalist. He was the founder, owner and principal engineer at Electrical Audio, a recording studio complex in Chicago. It has been estimated that he worked on several thousand albums over his career. He worked with acts such as Nirvana, Pixies, Bush, The Breeders, P.J. Harvey, The Jesus Lizard, and former Led Zeppelin members Jimmy Page and Robert Plant. He also played in various bands, most notably Big Black and Shellac. Albini was critical of the music industry, arguing that it exploited and stylistically homogenized artists. As a part of his opposition he refused to take royalties from artists he worked with, arguing that it was unethical. Early life Albini was born in Pasadena, California, to Gina, May Martinelli, and Frank Addison Albini. On his birth certificate, the middle name section says, none, as his father refused to leave it blank, his father was a wildfire researcher. He had two siblings. In his youth, Albini's family moved often, before settling in the college town of Missoula, Montana, in 1974, Albini was Italian-American, and some of his family are from the Piedmont region of northern Italy. While recovering from a broken leg, Albini began playing bass guitar and participated in bass lessons in high school for one week. He was introduced to the Ramones by a schoolmate on a field trip when he was 14 or 15. He felt it was the best music he had ever heard and bought every Ramones recording available to him, and credits his music career to hearing their first album. He said, I was baffled and thrilled by music like the Ramones, the Sex Pistols, Perubu, Devo, and all those contemporaneous, inspirational punk bands without wanting to try to mimic them. During his teenage years, Albini played in bands including the Montana punk band Just Ducky, the Chicago band Small Irregular Pieces of Aluminum, Stations, and another band that record label Touch and Go Slash Quarter Stick Records explained he, Albini, is paying us not to mention, da. After graduating from Hellgate High School, Albini moved to Evanston, Illinois, to attend college at the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University, where he earned a degree in journalism. He said that he studied painting in college with Ed Paschke, someone he calls a brilliant educator and one of the only people in college who actually taught me anything. In the Chicago area, Albini was active as a writer in local zines including Matter and Forced Exposure, covering the then-nascent punk rock scene and gained a reputation for the iconoclastic nature of his articles. About the same time, he began recording musicians and engineered his first album in 1981. He co-managed Ruthless Records, Chicago, with John Kesdy of the Effigies and John Babin, Criminal IQ Records. According to Albini, he maintained a straight job for or five years until 1987, working in a photography studio as a photograph retouch artist performing career 1981-1987, Big Black in 1981, Albini formed Big Black while he was a student at NU, and recorded Lungs, the band's debut EP, on Ruthless Records, Chicago, a label he co-managed with Babin and Kesdi. Albini played all of the instruments on Lungs, except the saxophone, played by his friend John Bonin. The Bulldozer, 1983, EP was released on Ruthless and Fever Records, Jeff Pizzotti and Santiago Durango, of Chicago band Naked Ray Gun, and live drummer Pat Byrne joined shortly thereafter, and the band along with a drum machine, the Roland TR-606, credited as Roland released the EP Racer X in 1984 after touring and signing a new contract with the Homestead Records business. Pizzotti commenced recording the I.L. Duce 7-inch single with the band, but returned to his original band before it was completed. Pezzotti was replaced on bass by Dave Riley, with whom the group recorded their debut full-length album Atomizer, 1986. The I.L. Duce recording was eventually finished with Riley as bassist. The band also released The Hammer Party while signed to Homestead, which was a compilation of the Lungs and Bulldozer EPs. Big Black left the Homestead label for Touch and Go Records in late 1985-slash-early 1986 and recorded Headache and the 7-inch single Heartbeat from June to August 1986 both were released the following year. Also in 1986, a live album titled Sound of Impact was released on the Not Slash Blast first label. 
The accompanying booklet provides insight into the band's influences. Albini cited bands such as Ramones, The Birthday Party, The Stooges, Suicide, SPK, Minor Threat, White House, Link Ray, Perubu, Chrome, Rudimentary Painty, The Four Skins, Throbbing Gristle, Screwdriver, The X, Minimal Man, U.S. Chaos, Gangrene, Tommy Stump, Swans and Bad Brains. In 1987, the band released songs about fucking, as well as the single, He's a Whore Slash the Model, both on Touch and Go, Big Black disbanded. Shortly after a period of extensive touring that year, in support of songs about fucking, Durango enrolled in law school and became a lawyer, 1987-1988. Rape Man Albini formed Rape Man in 1987. The band consisted of Albini, vocals, guitar, Ray Washam, drums, and David Williams Sims, bass. Both Washam and Sims were previously members of Scratch Acid. The band was named after a Japanese comic book. They broke up after the release of two seven inch singles Hated Chinny B. W. Marmoset, 1988 and Inky's But Crack B Slash W Song No. 1, 1989, the EP Bud, 1988, and the album Two Nuns and a Pack Mule album, also released in 1988 on Touch and Go. In a 2020 interview, Albini expressed regret for the name of the band, saying that he didn't feel he had been held to account for being in a band called Rape Man. He added that it was a flippant choice, calling it unconscionable and indefensible. He likened it to getting a bad tattoo. 1992-2024, Shellac Albini formed Shellac in 1992, with bandmates Bob Weston, formerly of Volcano Sons, and Todd Trainer, of Rifle Sport, Breaking Circus, and Brick Layer Cake. They initially released three EPs, The Rude Gesture, A Pictorial History, 1993, Uranus, 1993, and The Bird is the Most Popular Finger, 1994. The first two EP releases were on Touch and Go, while the third EP was a Drag City label release. Two years after formation, the Japanese label NUX organization released the Japan exclusive live album Live in Tokyo, followed by five studio albums At Action Park, 1994, Terraform, 1998, 1000 Hertz, 2000, Excellent Italian Greyhound, 2007, and Dude Incredible, 2014. All of Shellac's studio albums were released on vinyl as well as CD. On May 7, 2024, Albini died of a heart attack a week before Shellac's To All Trains was scheduled for release. Recording career for a chronological list of Albini's recording work, see Steve Albini discography as an audio engineer. Since the early 1990s, Albini was best known as a record producer, however, he disliked the term and preferred to receive no credit on album sleeves or notes. When credited, he preferred the term recording engineer. In 2004, Albini estimated that he engineered the recording of 1,500 albums, mostly by underground musicians. By 2018, his estimate had increased to several thousand. Artists that Albini worked with include Nirvana, Pixies, The Breeders, Godspeed You, Black Emperor, Mogwai, The Jesus Lizard, Don Caballero, PJ Harvey, The Wedding Present, Joanna Newsom, Superchunk, Low, Dirty Three, Jawbreaker, Neurosis, Cloud Nothings, Bush, Chevelle, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant, as Page and Plant, Comma, Helmet, Fred Schneider, The Stooges, Owls, Manic Street Preachers, Jarvis Cocker, The Cribs, The Fleshtones, Nina, Nastasia, The Frames, The Membranes, Cheap Trick, Motorpsycho, Slint, Klusky, Lab Bradford, Baruka, Salt, Zayo. The Auteurs, Spare Snare, Foxy Shazam, after the release of Schneider's album Just Fred, the Vinyl District's Joseph Neff wrote The reality is that when enlisted by the big leagues, Albini took his job just as seriously as when he was assisting on the debut recording from a bunch of aspiring unknowns. Stereogum's Tom Brahan stated in 2012, even though he's, Albini, been an outspoken opponent of the major label system, and of other underground rock heroes, he's known to work with just about anyone who requests his service. In February 2018, along with the Scottish lo-fi band Spare Snare, Albini presented a one-day audio engineer's workshop at Chem 19 Studios in Blantyre, Scotland, Methodology Albini in 2008 In Albini's opinion, putting producers in charge of recording sessions often destroys records, 
while the role of the recording engineer is to solve problems in capturing the sound of the musicians, not to threaten the artist's control over their product, Albini's recordings have been analyzed by writers, such as Michael Azarad, who is also a musician. In Azarad's 2001 book Our Band Could Be Your Life, Scenes from the American Indie Underground, 1981-1991, Azarad describes Albini's work on the Pixies album Surfer Rosa, the recordings were both very basic and very exacting, Albini used few special effects, got an aggressive, often violent guitar sound, and made sure the rhythm section slammed as one. Steve Vaughn Till of Neurosis recorded several albums with Albini and in 2013 stated, he is the best damn engineer in the world, I believe. He's very traditional, there's no tricks, there's no fix it later. There's only an extremely high fidelity approach towards capturing a natural performance in a room. Production influence is a key influence on Albini was English producer John Loder, who came to prominence in the late 1970s with a reputation for recording albums quickly and inexpensively, but nonetheless with distinctive qualities and a sensitivity towards a band's sound and aesthetic. Albini mentioned having an admiration for ethnomusicologist Alan Lomax, among his peers. Albini praised his frequent collaborator and shellac bandmate, Bob Weston, as well as Brian Paulson and Matt Barnhart. Among others, Nirvana and In Utero in 1993, Nirvana hired Albini for their third album, In Utero. Albini dismissed Nirvana as REM with a fuzzbox and an unremarkable version of the Seattle sound. However, he accepted the job because he felt sorry for them, perceiving them as the same sort of people as all the small fry bands I deal with at the mercy of their record company. Cobain said he chose Albini because he had produced two of his favorite records, Surfer Rosa, 1988, by the Pixies and Pod, 1990, by the Breeders. Cobain wanted to use Albini's technique of capturing the natural ambience of a room via the placement of several microphones, something previous Nirvana producers had been averse to trying. At Albini's recommendation, Nirvana went to Pachyderm Studios in Minnesota to record the album. Albini chose the studio in part due to its isolation, hoping to keep representatives of Nirvana's record label, DGC Records, away. Recording was completed in six days, Cobain had anticipated disagreements with Albini, whom he had heard was supposedly this sexist jerk, but called the process the easiest recording we've ever done, hands down. Dot. Once the label and management heard the resulting recording, they were displeased with it. The members of Nirvana had mixed feelings as well. Cobain said afterward that the first time he played it at home, I got no emotion from it, and considered re-recording the songs with more radio-friendly production, however, a month later, having listened to it more and played it for friends, he felt that it was exactly the kind of record I would buy as a fan. The band did collectively decide that the vocals and bass were too low in the mix. They asked Albini to remix the album, but he refused as he was happy with the results and feared that the process would lead to a spiral of recriminations and remixes among himself, the band and the record company. During the remastering process, engineer Bob Ludwig raised the volume of the vocals and sharpened the bass guitar sound. Additionally, REM producer Scott Litt was brought in to remix several of the songs. The final album was a critical and commercial success, and remains. Strongly associated with Albini, Despite Albini's contention that the finished album doesn't sound all that much like the record that was made, asked about In Utero in 2004, Albini stated that the record label was responsible for the difficulties that marred the trajectory of the album. Albini said In Utero made him unpopular with major record labels, and he faced problems finding work in the year following. Electrical Audio Albini bought Electrical Audio, his personal recording studio. In 1995, Due to a lack of privacy for Albini and his wife he moved to the studio. Albini's former studio was in their house, eventually taking over almost all the rooms, with the exception of the bedroom. Before electrical audio, Albini had a studio in the basement of another personal residence. Musician Robbie Folks recalls the hassle of running up two flights of stairs all the time from the tracking room to communicate with Albini. Albini did not receive royalties for anything he recorded or mixed at his own facility. Unlike many other engineer-slash-record producers with his experience and prominence. At Electrical Audio in 2004, Albini earned a daily fee of US$750 for engineering work, and drew a salary of US$24,000 a year. 
Azarad referred to Albini's rates in 2001 as among the most affordable for a world-class recording studio. After the completion of the studio's construction, Albini initially charged only for his time, allowing his friends or musicians he respected who were willing to engineer their own recording sessions and purchase their own magnetic tape to use his studio free. In a 2004 lecture, Albini said that he always deals with bands directly at Electrical Audio and answers the phone himself in. The studio, musical influences Albini mentioned his liking for good guitar, saying good noise is like orgasm. He commented, anybody can play notes. There's no trick. What is a trick and a good one is to make a guitar do things that don't sound like a guitar at all. The point here is stretching the boundaries. Albini praised guitarists including Andy Gill of Gang of Four, Roland S. Howard of Birthday Party, John McKay of Susie and the Banshees, Keith Levine of Public Image LTD, Steve Diggle and Pete Shelley of Buzzcocks, Ron Ashton of The Stooges, Paul Fox of The Ruts, Greg Jinn of Black Flag, Lyle Pressler of Minor Threat, John McGeoch of Magazine and the Banshees, and Tom Verlaine of Television. Albini praised Andy Gill's guitar tone on Gang of Four's Entertainment and said, he, makes six strings produce more beautiful, broken noise than anybody. He praised John McKay for his work on Susie and the Banshees as the scream, saying only now people are trying to copy it, and even now nobody understands how that guitar player got all that pointless noise to stick together as songs. Albini cited Ron Ashton, he made great squealy death noise feedback. He also described John McGeoch's guitar playing as great choral swells, great scratches, and buzzes, and great dissonant noise. He admired Tom Verlaine for his ability to twist almost any conceivable sound out of a guitar. Views Music Production Albini was an advocate and enthusiast of analog recording, with many of his band's releases featuring precise descriptions of equipment used in his recording and engineering in their liner notes. In a 1987 quote on the back cover of the CD version of Big Black Songs About Fucking, he lambasted digital recording, saying that, T, he future belongs to the analog loyalists. Fuck digital. He maintained his support, personally stating in a 2013 interview that using digital files as audio masters carries risks because files can be industrially mishandled or deliberately discarded. In Albini's essay, The Problem with Music, which was first published in the December 1993 issue of Art and Criticism journal The Baffler. He criticized the excessive use of equalizers and compression which he wrote makes everything sound like a beer commercial observing that producers and engineers who raise the volume of vocals in order to make the music they are engineering sound more like the Beatles pander to commercial interests. He also wrote that when he hears producers and engineers use meaningless words like punchy and warm, he feels the need to throttle somebody. Asked about these statements in a 2018 interview, Albini said that because of the reduction in the power of record labels over the previous 25 years, the prevalence of producers who are there only to exert artistic control over the recording had dropped significantly. In contrast, digital recording had, in his words, enabled many more people than before to achieve the freedom to do productive work as audio engineers, music industry and the problem with music, Albini significantly criticized the music industry and the major record labels of the time for financially exploiting and deceiving their artists. In the essay's longest section, he sketched out a financial breakdown to show how a hypothetical band selling 250,000 copies of a major label debut album would end up making only about one-third as much as they would working at a 7 to 11 from the album due to all the expenditures the label makes, ostensibly on their behalf. In a 2004 presentation at Middle Tennessee State University, Albini reaffirmed this stance. In November 2014, Albini delivered the keynote speech at the Face the Music conference in Melbourne, Australia, where he discussed the evolution of the music scene and industry since he started making music in the late 1970s. He described the pre-internet corporate music industry as a system that ensured waste by rewarding the most profligate spendthrifts in a system specifically engineered to waste the band's money, which aimed to perpetuate its structures and business arrangements while preventing bands, except four monumental stars, from earning a living. He contrasted it with the independent scene, which encouraged resourcefulness and established an alternative network of clubs, promoters, fanzines, DJs, and labels and allowed musicians to make a reasonable income due to the system's greater efficiency, 
music streaming Albini, right, with Ani DeFranco and RZA at the New Yorker Festival in September 2005 Albini was asked about file sharing in June 2014 and he clarified that, while he does not believe that the technological development is the best thing for the music industry, he does not identify with the music industry. He considers the community, the band, the musician as his peers, and is pleased that musicians can get their music out to the world at no cost instantly. Duh. As part of the Face the Music speech, Albini noted that both the corporate and independent industry models had been damaged by internet file sharing. However, he praised the spread of free music as being a fantastic development, which allowed previously ignored music and bands to find an audience, citing the protopunk band Death as one. Example the use of the internet as a distribution channel for music to be heard worldwide, and the increasing affordability of recording equipment, all of which allow bands to circumvent the traditional recording industry. Albini also argued that the increased availability of recorded music stimulates demand for live music, boosting bands' income. Albini critiqued Jay-Z's subscription-only, lossless audio streaming service title in an April 2015 interview with Vulture.com. He said that streaming services eventually would be taken over by a more convenient technology. He added that convenience would trump sound quality in streaming and audiophiles would prefer vinyl to streaming. He said that the internet has a history of breaking limitations placed on its content by making paid-for products freely available. Music journalism in 1983, Albini wrote for Matter, a monthly new U.S. music magazine appeared at the time in Chicago. He wrote in each issue a chronicle called Tired of Ugly Fat, comma, and also contributed articles such as Husker Do? Only their hairdresser knows for sure. Dot. In 1994, Albini wrote a famous letter to music critic Bill Wyman, not to be confused with rock musician Bill Wyman, which was published in the Chicago Reader, calling Wyman a music press stooge for having championed three Chicago-based music acts whom Albini labeled as frauds, Liz Fair, The Smashing Pumpkins, and Urge Overkill. While in Australia in November 2014, Albini spoke with national radio station Double J and stated that, while the state of the music industry is healthy in his view, the industry of music journalism is in crisis. Albini used the example of the media spotlight that he received after criticizing Amanda Palmer for not paying her musicians after receiving over $1 million on Kickstarter to release her 2012 album Theater is Evil saying, I don't think I was wrong, but I also don't think that it was that big of a deal. He described the music media as superficial and composed of copy-paste bullshit. Albini frequently expressed a general dislike for pop music, and in a 2015 interview told 2SER Sydney that pop music is for children and idiots. He expressed a loathing for electronic dance music and the entire club scene to techno producer Oscar Powell in 2015, who quoted Albini in a Billboard advert and music video for his track Insomniac, which samples Albini. Powell found Albini's dismissal of the track to be ironic, considering that while he chose not to listen to it, Powell felt it. Bore more similarity to the early industrial music that Albini cited than popular EDM music festivals Albini criticized music festivals for their corporatization of popular alternative music. In a 1993 interview, he said of Lollapalooza, Lollapalooza is the worst example of corporate encroachment into what is supposed to be the underground. It is just a large-scale marketing of bands that pretend to be alternative, but are in reality, just another facet of the mass cultural exploitation scheme. I have no appreciation or affection for those bands, and I have no interest in that whole circle. If Lollapalooza had Jesus Lizard and the Melvins and Fugazi and Slint, then you could make a case that it was actually people on the vanguard of music. What it really is is the most popular bands on MTV that are not heavy metal. Shellac notably does not play festivals, with the exception of Primavera Sound in Barcelona, where the band played every edition since 2006, except for 2007. Shellac had to be convinced by Mogwai to play their curated edition of the now defunct All Tomorrow's Parties, ADP, in 2001, which the band performed regularly at. Albini said, they completely changed the festival game. Now the whole world has to operate under the knowledge that there are these cool, Curated festivals where everyone is treated well, and the experience is a generally pleasant one. We didn't like the cattle call nature of unrelated artists playing in an uncurated fashion. 
we established the precedent that we weren't gonna play festivals, most festivals, there's a competition to get the biggest names as headliners, then everybody else was whoever was on tour, and then the bottom rungs were filled with payola spots where labels would pay to get people added to a bill. ADP was entirely curated. Somebody chose every single one of those bands because they thought they were awesome. After this, Shellac had a long standing involvement with ADP and were often referred to as ADP's house band. Shellac were the curators of ADP at Camber Sands, UK in 2002, and 2012, co curated in 2004, and also played at several other editions of the festival, including its final UK holiday camp event in 2013. Media Appearances Albini is featured in the first episode of the 2014 documentary miniseries Foo Fighters, Sonic Highways, Chicago Wink with a Frown, he is shown talking about being a producer, as well as recording the Foo Fighters song, Something from Nothing. He appeared in a number of documentary films and videos about the making of various albums that he produced, including Josephine by Magnolia Electric Company, 2009, This Is Nowhere by Malo Jian, 2016, Comma, Carrier Wave by Porcupine, 2019, and In Bed with Medusa by Medusa, 2020. Rock vs. Cancer, a 2018 short documentary about the making of the 2012 album, The Strain by Teeth, additionally features Albini as the narrator. Albini was a guest on the audio podcast WTF with Mark Marin in 2015. The 2019 short documentary Albini Cashes In, part of the stories from the Felt series for the streaming service Poker Geo, is about Albini's 2018 World Series of Poker Win. Other activities Albini began a cooking and food blog, titled Mario Battle of Voice, What I Made Heather for Dinner, in March 2011. Albini was an avid poker player and ranked in 12th place at the 2013 World Series of Poker, WSOP, Seniors Championship. Albini won his first WSOP gold bracelet at the $1,500 seven card stud at 2018 World Series of Poker, WSOP. He beat out Jeff Lissandro to win $105,629. He won his second gold bracelet at the 2022 WSOP in the $1,500 HORSE event. Albini regularly engaged in public speaking appointments for the audio industry. Personal life Albini was married to film director Heather Winna, and they lived in Chicago. His right leg was slightly deformed as a result of a car accident when he was 18. In 2010, he revealed that he was not an avid consumer of media. However, he watched a lot of cat videos on YouTube and avoided seeing feature films. In a 2011 interview, Albini said he was an agnostic atheist. According to a 2022 interview, Albini avoided drugs and alcohol. He stated that his father was an alcoholic and that made him aware of his own vulnerability to addiction. Albini died from a heart attack at his home in Chicago on May 7, 2024, at the age of 61.